Our first speaker, I'm delighted, I just was able to meet yesterday for the first time. He's a remarkable fellow. Dr. Ben Goldacre is an award-winning writer and broadcaster. He's a medical doctor. And actually, last night we had a small, minor little medical problem at the reception, instantly taken care of. Uh, I noticed we had nine physicians surrounding the person who was feeling poorly, two nurses, a couple of EMTs. And I thought, at this conference, the only thing that could get quicker response would be if someone would yell, my laptop won't boot. Dr. Goldacre is, uh, is with us today. He writes for The Guardian in the UK since 2003. He's regularly uh, an expert on TV and radio, and we're delighted to have, please welcome Dr. Ben Goldacre. I had a geek conversation with someone last night about who was the bigger nerd, and uh, it was like, you know, PDA battles, how well configured your, your portable device is. And I won by having a small wedgy corner cut out on my right thumbnail so that I can use it as a stylus on the screen. <laughs> That's one of the most useful things you'll learn in the next 30 minutes. Am I on the screen yet? No. Yes! Oh, so exciting. That's the closest I'm going to get to a magic trick today, I'm afraid. I might be one of the few people on the stage who've never worn a cape. But I can, I can put my tweed jacket around my collar, if you like, and that's the sort of academic equivalent. Um, right. What I wanted to talk about today is the squabbles that have happened around homeopathy, not just now, but for the past 200 years, really, since its inception. Not because I think homeopathy is the most important thing in the world, because it's not. I teach a, a course called, um, uh, well, I teach uh, medical students and doctors on, on uh, critically appraising clinical trial methodology, or as I like to call it, drug company bullshit. I was very pleased to see that verbatim in the UCL timetable. Um, and what I find interesting about homeopathy is that you can apply the same tools that you use to assess whether a medical drug works to homeopathy. But because the issues are so much simpler in homeopathy, it makes a very good teaching tool. But this won't be my clinical trial methodology lecture. <laughs> You'll be relieved to hear. Uh, and I think there are some very interesting rhetorical issues and historical issues to be found in, in the ongoing discussions that have happened around homeopathy for the past two centuries. So uh, why would you care about homeopathy? Well, firstly, um, if I do that, I can see the screen and the microphone. Why, why care about homeopathy? Well, uh, firstly, it's just interesting and fun to, to pull things apart and see how they work. You know, that's, that's why we like Linux, that's why we like PDAs, that's why we like thinking about psychics or, or alternative therapies, because when we see how these things really work, then that's often much more interesting than the sort of magic story about quantum distortions in the hysteria field or whatever. Um, and they're interesting even if you can't put them back together again. I think also, Thinking about alternative therapies is important and interesting because at the moment, particularly in England, alternative therapies have pretty much full spectrum dominance in the newspapers. And by distorting the public's understanding of evidence, by promoting the public misunderstanding of evidence, they undermine all of the good work that's being done by doctors at the moment, and this is a relatively modern phenomenon, where doctors try now to work collaboratively with their patients towards an optimum health outcome. That's what it says in the communication skills textbooks that I teach from. Um, but what it means is that doctors are keen now to talk with their patients, discuss the evidence, and come to a decision with them. And that requires that people aren't being constantly misled about what a trial means and how evidence works. But lastly, and this is by no means the most important, there are practical consequences, obviously. Uh, in Britain recently, uh, somebody sent, ten, uh, sent, sent a student to 10 homeopaths and said, look, I'm going to this high-risk malaria area. Uh, you know, what shall I do? I'm not very keen on taking malaria tablets. And the homeopaths, 9 out of 10, said, oh, just have some of our um, homeopathic malaria prophylaxis pills. They'll do you fine. It's not desperately responsible. Uh, well over half of all the homeopaths approached undercover uh, recommended a mother not to give the MMR vaccine to their child. And um, the Society of Homeopaths, the biggest uh, EU um, membership organization for homeopaths, uh, had a conference in December on treating HIV and AIDS with homeopathy, which is just childish, really. I'm going to try and break this laptop by pulling it up here so I can see it without breaking my eye line. If everything goes horribly wrong, I apologize to the owner. Seamless. Okay, so what is homeopathy? 
Well, it's based on a few basic principles. Firstly, the idea that like cures like. So Samuel Hahnemann, the chap who first uh, concocted the idea of homeopathy, I think concoct or decided uh, are probably the right words rather than discover, um, he took some quinine and said, oh, well, the symptoms that I'm getting from quinine, which turned out to be an idiosyncratic reaction, <laughs> but he said, oh, the, the symptoms I get from quinine are a bit like having malaria. So maybe if you take a microscopically small amount of quinine, then that will help to treat malaria. So like cures like is one principle. But the second and more important principle of homeopathy that everybody would recognize is very extreme dilutions. Now when we say extreme dilutions, the Society of Homeopaths says 30C, uh, which is the standard homeopathic preparation, contains less than one part per million of the original substance. To my mind, that's something of an underestimate. Uh, 30C dilution is one in 100 done 30 times over. So that's 100 to the power of 30, or 10 to the power of 60, uh, or to put it in the terms of the Society of Homeopaths, less than one in a million, 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 million. <laughs> Just for clarity, you understand. <laughs> to put that in perspective, uh, in an Olympic swimming pool, if you count up all the molecules, that's your job, not mine. <laughs> Uh, you'll find a hundred million, 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 million water molecules. So you'd need about 10,000 million, 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 million of those to have one molecule. Uh, if you imagine a sphere that's diameter is the distance from here to the Earth, to, from the, here, anywhere on the Earth really will do, to the Sun. Uh, it takes light about eight minutes to travel that distance. Uh, uh, in that sphere, that's one, and one molecule in there, that's roughly equivalent to a 30C dilution. Well, it's 30.89C, just because I know that I'm in a room full of pedants. And if you imagine a universe filled with water, so that's three times 10 to the 80 cubic meters. I'm aware that the chap on next is from NASA, so I don't want to get these figures too wrong. <laughs> but three times 10 to the 80, that's, uh, you know, uh, perfect space to start a family. <laughs> Fill that with water, that would only be a 55C dilution, and commonly you can buy 200C dilutions, perfectly standard from homeopaths, and that's more than the number of atoms in the universe. <laughs> so is, is the implausibility of how it works the way to go in a discussion with a homeopath? Well, it certainly gets entertainingly childish quite quickly. They, they say, well, you know, that, but you're, going, you're barking at the wrong tree because water, water has a memory. And you go, okay, fair enough. But you don't actually give water. What you do is you drop a drop of your water onto some sugar pills. And then you shake the sugar pills in the little pot. And then you hand those out. So what about the memory of sugar? <laughs> and also, you start thinking through the sort of the inconsistencies. Like you say, well, how, can, how does the water remember the, the arnica that you're trying to treat me with, you know, the homeopathic arnica dilution? Why does it remember that and not? The fact that it was once in the Queen's bladder, God bless her, or you know Hitler's eyeball, or um, Nelson's bum, <laughs> and they say, "Ah, well." You see, I made this point in the Guardian a little while ago in a, in a long article that was all about sort of critical trial, crit critical appraisal of clinical trial methodology, but m made a reference to this ridiculous dilution thing and the inconsistencies. And Henry Pat wrote in and said, "No." The way that the water knows to remember only the special thing that we're diluting in it is because of succussion. You bang it 10 times firmly against a hard but elastic object, ideally a bespoke wooden striking board covered in horsehair and leather. And because you did not mention that, you made us look stupid. <laughs> So has this line of argument worked over the years? Well, I would contest no. Firstly, it's very easy to get bogged down in detail around the memory of water issue. I know that there's a subtitle, isn't there? The, 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 uh, the skepticism in the internet age. And actually, there are some very good illustrations of how valuable the internet can be in, um, in, in the memory of water uh, 
squabbles that have happened over the past few years. What happens is periodically uh, a homeopath finds a, a junior physicist or just some laboratory equipment and will do a study that shows some small, absolutely minuscule difference between two different sets of water, one of which has been prepared homeopathically and one of which has been prepared, which is just normal water. And they'll do this with exquisitely oversensitive equipment. But in fact, nine times out of 10, it's either a false positive due to a failure to correct for multiple comparisons, which I really promise not to bore you with right now. Although if you like the Bonferroni correction lecture, I could give that later in private. It's not very interesting, Bonferroni correction for multiple comparisons. Um, or there are just very obvious methodological flaws. Or obvious if you're the kind of guy who knows how to use a you know, Raymond spectrometry machine or whatever, because they prepared the water in obviously different ways that were, only, that were inevitably going to get picked up by very sensitive equipment. And what's great about the internet is that somewhere out there, there'll be somebody who can be bothered to go through these claims, go through these papers, critically appraise them, and post on their blog, like Spalman, for example, or Danny Crastina's blog, post on their blog a critical appraisal of these claims of these papers. Recently, the, the journal Homeopathy published a whole string of papers purporting to show the memory of water. And uh, I got in touch with the publisher. I got their permission to reproduce the contents of them online on, on badscience.net. And we had a journal club, just like you have you know, at lunchtime once a week in any academic teaching hospital and most academic units. And people went through, they critically appraised the papers, and then we summed up all of the criticisms at the end. And this also happened on the JUF forums, and everybody came together. And they produced a letter which they sent to the journal and which was published in the academic journal, which I think is an, is an extraordinary coup, really, for a bunch of jokers on the internet. You know, There's a very good XKCD uh, joke about uh, people being unable to let things lie on the internet. There's a, a really hot chick and this guy at his laptop, and she's saying, come to bed, darling. And he says, I can't. Somebody is wrong on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we need to harness that power. <laughs> but the most important reason not to bother with this, you know, the memory of water thing, the implausibility argument, I think is that you know, as, as rhetorical strategies go, it's had 150 years of fail, which is a word I enjoy using as a noun. I'm in America. This is the home of neologisms. Uh, so this chap here is John Forbes. I've modeled my facial hair on him, as you can see. <laughs> he was the Queen Victoria's physician. And in 1846, he was talking about the implausibility of homeopathy. So here he is, uh, I've, the blah, blah is added by me. Uh, homeopathic globules side by side, blah, blah, blah. Would reach from the earth to the sun, blah, 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 blah. 100 million, 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 million. This was 162 years ago, and it hasn't persuaded anyone since. And he wasn't just talking to himself or Queen Victoria. I mean, this chap, you know, he wrote in uh, medical, uh, he, he, he uh, wrote articles about medicine in, in mainstream newspapers, you know, like me, except I'm not the Queen's physician. In fact, the Queen's physician is the director of the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital. So that's how things have changed. And we lost the empire. Can they be related? I don't know. <laughs> but more importantly, the argument about the implausibility of homeopathy is completely irrelevant. There are, I, th I think, dozens of doctors here, which is unsurprising. And lots of women, I'm very pleased to see. I mean, that wasn't a, it's not, I'm not, you know. <laughs> I know the doctors will know. You know, I, when I was a junior doctor, I, 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 I have cut a man's abdomen open with my own hands. Supervised, I hasten to add. I've delved in there, I've pulled out his appendix, I've chopped out the dodgy bit, sewn everything up again, and he's been fine. We have basically no really good story for how anaesthetics work. We just don't know how anaesthetics work. But we do know that they work. And that's the difference. With homeopathy, we don't know how it works. But actually, when you look at it, we know that it doesn't work, or at least it doesn't work any better than placebo. Now this is kind of what doctors do for a living. There's an entire industry of people who do evidence-based medicine, medical statistics, you know, tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands around the, around the country, around the world. Um, I've got to remember I'm outside of England now. I've never been to America before. I'm temporally, culturally, and morally completely <laughs> disoriented. 
So uh, this story of how do you know if a pill works, this is, this, is, this is bread and butter. You know, it doesn't get any easier than this. So let's imagine that we're having a chat with a homeopathy fan, a patient who likes it, or a practitioner. And you say, look, you know, we'll try, we'll, we should try and reach an accord, you know. And they say, look, all I know is I feel better with homeopathy. So you go, great. Okay, fine. So perhaps that could be the placebo effect. Because the placebo effect is incredibly powerful and also incredibly interesting. Placebo effect isn't just about uh, taking a sugar pill. Placebo effect is about the cultural meaning of a treatment. So, for example, we know that uh, four sugar pills are more effective than two sugar pills at clearing gastric ulcers. This is an extraordinary finding. Gastric ulcers are a pretty unambiguous finding. You stick a camera down somebody's throat and you look there and they're either there or they're not. Four sugar pills a day clear gastric ulcers faster than two sugar pills a day. We know that salt water injections are more effective at pain relief than sugar pills. Not because salt water injections have any you know, pharmacological action on the body, but because it's a more dramatic intervention. The placebo effect is possibly the most interesting and extraordinary thing in medicine. We know that, that pill colour has an effect. And of course, the, the pharmaceutical industry know this as well. That's why you know, anxiety treatment pills are blue and green, not bright red. We know that packaging, packaging makes a difference. Classic study, Branthwaite and Cooper. They did a forearm study where they had either sugar pills or pills with proper uh, painkiller in them. And they were packaged either in blank packaging or in the proper big brand name commercial packaging. And they found there was obviously a significant benefit from having painkiller in the pill compared with just a sugar pill, but they also found a significant impact on pain just from the packaging alone. Now this has important ramifications for everyone in this room because you're all clever dick skeptics and you like to walk around saying things like, Mom, why do you buy brand name Nurofen instead of own brand ibuprofen when it's exactly the same molecule in both? But actually your mum's right, Nurofen works better than, than supermarket brand ibuprofen. She's right. You're wrong. Embrace that. And that's what being a skeptic is all about. <laughs> so the placebo effect is extraordinary. Works in animals, works in children. There's a biological story about it. You know, we know that it, you, can, you can set up uh, in an animal a condition response between taking uh, flavoured water with uh, an immune suppressant in it, and then you take the immune suppressant out, just give the flavoured water, and you'll still have the immune system changes. We know that you can give uh, human subjects uh, a placebo sugar pill, which they're expecting to be a dopaminergic treatment for their Parkinson's, and it will change the amount of dopamine being released in their basal ganglia. The placebo effect is probably the most astonishing thing in medicine, and certainly a lot more interesting than any kind of fairy tale about morphic resonance and quantum stuff in sugar pills. So we go back to our homeopathy fan and we say, look, maybe it's the placebo effect. And they say, well, look, all I know is I feel better with homeopathy. And you go, fine. So maybe it's regression to the mean. So regression to the mean is absolutely fascinating. We know that basically, as, as New Agers like to say, all things have a cycle. You know, your back pain gets bad, and then it gets better again. Your menopause comes on, and it goes away because it's self-limiting. You know, menopause doesn't last forever, despite what the manufacturers of HRT might like to try and persuade you. Uh, you know, if you have a viral cold, it'll get better. And it's natural to assume that anything you do when your symptoms are at their peak are what caused you to get better. So in the case of a viral cold, if you took a homeopathic pill, you might get better. Uh, this is an increasing order of ridiculousness. If you hang dangled goat syndromes around your neck, you might think, oh, that's what made me get better. Brilliant result. Or you might get antibiotics off your doctor, which is even more ridiculous than both because they don't treat viral colds. <laughs> Here's a distraction, just because I'm obsessed with uh, this area. Um, the correct thing to do when a patient comes to you with a sore throat that's very clearly a viral cold is to empower them and to say, look, it's fine, just go home, plenty of water, bed rest, you know, look after yourself, that'll all be great. Doctors prescribe antibiotics to, 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 to whiny patients just to get them out of the door because we think it's going to get, you know, it's going to get us a quieter session in clinic. But that's actually not true. People have studied that. And if you turn away 100 people who are demanding antibiotics for a viral cold and a sore throat, 33 fewer will believe that they're effective. It's a false belief that, of which they should be disabused. 25 fewer intend to come back, and 10 fewer come back the next year. Now, if you're a homeopath, you might turn this on your head. 
on its head because you know you want more trade but you just keep giving out the pills so you go back to your homeopathy fan and you say look maybe it's just about regression to the mean and the placebo and they say all i know is i feel better with homeopathy and you think oh christ is one person's word ever useful outside of a statistical context? I mean, it's an interesting question. There are cases where anecdotal evidence is useful. Maybe if we had a, a really clear, kind of unambiguous case of someone getting better from cancer, terminal cancer, would that be impressive? Well, the reality is, you know, we're in Vegas. Amazing things happen. You know, people win huge amounts of money. This entire city was built on a mixture of irrationality and that fact. There's a study here from the Australian oncologists where they took 2,337 patients with terminal cancer. They died on average after five months, but 1% were still alive after five years. If they dangled the goats in trails or had the homeopathic sugar pill, they'd be attributing it to that. But amazing things just happen. So to get through this, you do a trial. And I'm sure everybody knows in this room how to do a trial. You get maybe 200 people, split them into two groups of 100. Half of them get the proper homeopathy pills that have been treated with all the hocus pocus, and the other half just get normal sugar pills. This is not a new idea. I mean, people have been doing clinical trials for a long time. I don't know much about Christ or any of that stuff, but I do know that Daniel, is Daniel Old Testament or new? Old, okay, good. <laughs> I was gonna say, I don't know much about Christ, but I do know that Daniel is, and then I thought, I don't. <laughs> So, and Daniel is Old Testament, and I knew that. Uh, and here's it, the first ever clinical trial on record. It's from the Old Testament, Daniel 1.16. The king was saying, you've all got to eat meat to be good soldiers. And he said, we don't want to eat meat. Just give us vegetables. And they said, no, no, you've got to have meat. And he said, it was this eunuch that was sent from the king. And the eunuch said, look, if I don't make you eat meat, the king's going to do whatever it is you do to a eunuch to make his life even worse. <laughs> And he said, look, we'll do a trial, we'll see what happens, you know, six weeks later. And six weeks later, they were just as strong, so they were let off the meat. Don't know what was wrong with the meat. So here's something weird. There have been 200 trials done on homeopathy. I have, like, 10 minutes to explain the entirety of evidence-based medicine tea. Big idea, short slot, tough crowd. Here we go. <laughs> uh, this is my magic trick. 200 trials have been done on homeopathy. People who know about evidence say, well, Homeopathy works no better than placebo. Homeopaths say these trials show that homeopathy works better than placebo. How do you explain this mismatch? How is that possible? Well, firstly, there's cherry picking. People just pick out the positive studies because there are bound to be some positive studies just by the play of chance. But that's not enough to explain it. So you put all the trials together. You do a meta-analysis. You stick all of the trials that have ever been done on homeopathy into one big spreadsheet. Now, just here, this is the, this is the uh, emblem for the Cochrane Collaboration, probably the most important new institution in medicine of the last 100 years. This is a, a blobogram. God, it's insanity to try and explain this. But basically, uh, in the 70s and 80s, lots of people were doing studies looking at whether steroids improved uh, preterm baby survival. And all of the studies came out being kind of borderline negative and basically negative. You can see the horizontal lines are all touching the big line that goes down the middle. That means they didn't have a significant positive result. It wasn't statistically significant. Somebody's yawning already. All of these trials were negative, And people were going, well, we don't know if this works or not. So people generally weren't doing it. Then, after 10 years of people ignoring this treatment, somebody came along and did a meta-analysis. That little diamond shape at the bottom doesn't touch the middle line. They showed that in the aggregate, when you pull all of that data together, actually steroids do save lives in preterm babies. The evidence was always there, but nobody had bothered to add it up in that special way. We had to wait for Excel to be invented or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, these ideas are important. They save lives. But there's even dispute over the meta-analyses, because the homeopaths say, oh, the meta-analyses show that homeopathy works better than placebo. And, the, and people like us say, well, no, the meta-analyses show that homeopathy doesn't work better than placebo. And that's because it's not just about doing a trial. There are good trials and bad trials. I'll skip that slide. <laughs> this is a lot of trials with quite serious methodological flaws. <laughs> On another day. <laughs> um, so what are the kind of flaws you can have? Well, uh, uh, well, actually, on this one, so uh, third one down, you can see on the right-hand side, 41 dropouts. You can see that very clearly. 41 dropouts out of 100 people in a trial. That's a phenomenal dropout rate. We know that when people drop out, they're more likely to have done badly. They might not come back to clinic, for example, because they didn't do well on the tablets, they had horrible side effects, they couldn't be bothered to take them, or they're dead. 
So lots of dropouts is a bad sign in a trial. Lots of these trials, there were no statistics done. The numbers were all too small. Sometimes you can get things like inadequate blinding. If, if there's inadequate blinding, then people don't know. People, people can't know if they're on the tablets or if they're on the real treatment or the fake treatment, right? Because if they know, then that spoils everything. So here is a study on acupuncture. You can see on the left, when people didn't know whether they were getting real acupuncture or sham acupuncture, there was no difference between the two. But on the right, you can see the two bars. If they knew that they were getting real acupuncture or if they were told they were getting fake acupuncture, who's going to get better when they're being told they're being given fake acupuncture? Where's the dignity in that? And that's a problem in all trials. And we know that in all trials, blinding, failed blinding, overestimates treatment benefits by 17%. Or you can have bad randomization. It's a, you've got to randomize people into the treatment group or the placebo group because if you're allowed to put people in whichever group you want, then that's ridiculous. Obviously, you're going to put all the punters, and I use the word punter advisedly in medicine because it reflects the element of chance in all clinical contact. <laughs> if you put... If you, if you get to choose which group you put people in, then you're going to put the patients who you know are going to do well in the treatment arm and the patient you know are going to do badly in the placebo arm, and then suddenly your trial looks really great. Or you might do it unconsciously. Actually, randomization isn't a new idea. 1662, that's not bad, is it? Why would you ignore an idea from 1662 when it works so well? Um, or you get, you get dodgy randomization in trials. And there's no point in doing a trial with bad randomization. Alternative therapists of all flavours always say, well, you know, we don't have the money to do proper trials, as if it's really expensive, as if it's really difficult. Common sense doesn't cost anything. Randomising properly doesn't cost anything. Doing trials with inadequate randomization is a waste of money and a waste of the patients who have given their bodies over to you for you to do an experiment on them, on the understanding that you're going to do an experiment that produces information. That's the ethical transaction. Bad research is unethical. So overall... The dodgy trials, the trials that are methodologically inept, the trials which are not fair tests, the ones on the left-hand side of this graph, show that homeopathy is better than placebo. As the methodological quality of the trials improves, so the result tends towards homeopathy is no better than placebo. And if you look at the meta-analyses that homeopaths quote, they say, Exactly the same meta-analyses, which I would quote as negative, because I only quote the figure for the most rigorous trials, they quote the figure for all of the trials, including the unfair tests. And that is a spectacularly anal and detailed explanation of why homeopaths are morons. <laughs> are they lying? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. There's a man called Henry Frankfurt, who's a philosopher at Princeton. He wrote a very interesting monograph called On Bullshit. He says, it's impossible for someone to lie unless they know the truth. The honest man says what he believes to be true. The liar considers his statements to be false. For the bullshit, however, all bets are off. He is neither on the side of truth nor on the side of the false. The bullshitter seeks only to impress us. These trials for homeopaths are window dressing. But more importantly than anything to do with homeopathy are the background issues. The placebo effect is amazing. It's amazing. It's so much more interesting than homeopathy. People with terminal cancer sometimes live. And that's amazing too. Evidence-based medicine is extremely interesting, as you can see there. You enjoyed the bit about the blubbergram and the big diagram of meta-analyses. <laughs> and lastly, sceptics and homeopaths have been having the exact same squabbles for 150 years. Thank you very much.